He says, Hey, trainer road and guests. I'm an average cat four road crit racer and recently got dropped on a local hard group ride through. And he mentions a through and off style ride. So what he's talking about there is like, it's hard enough so that there were pace lines necessary at the front. Right. It says I looked into the data using trainer road and can see that at the point I got dropped, I pushed 584 Watts average. And he mentions that 7.2 Watts per kilogram for 31 seconds with 816 watt max. So that's, that's hard. That's a lot of power right there. This happened about 50 minutes into a 30 or about 31 kilometers into the ride. And also worth mentioning, and Ian, I hope you're okay with this. I did some snooping on your account, but um, uh, I had to, to get more information on this. But uh, at this point you had an FTP of 314 Watts. So uh, Ian says, I have a max three second power of 1,320 Watts. So generally my anaerobic power isn't a limiter over short efforts. But I also rarely train anything above four, around 400 watts when following my current training plans. So my question is, should I train specifically for these in between, and he says in quotes, VO2 style full on sprint efforts as they appear to be a weakness. For example, would 30 seconds at 200% with 60 seconds zone two recovery repeats actually make me stronger over 30 seconds? Or are there better ways to go about making the adaptations I'm after? Thanks for all you do uh, from Ian. So I went, I went deep into this, okay? And this is another great, maybe misattribution has been the theme of this episode, right? Where we think it's one thing, but it's actually probably a host of other things. So this is really common. We uh, hear this in the context of climbing. People think they're bad climbers. It's because they get dropped on a climb because that's a more decisive moment. It's like more heavily weighted. And as a result, that's where things will show. However, in many cases, you probably had the fitness to stay on that climb. It's just everything you did leading up to that climb. And this is a very similar scenario. So we're going to show the anatomy of how Ian blew up and we're going to talk about it. Okay. So first, uh, Ian started off the ride with four minutes of attacks, creating 328 normalized power and 319 average power and peaking at 1031 Watts. So that's a really hard start to the ride considering as a 314 watt FTP. Then settled into a round sweet spot for a bit. That's what he averaged in terms of average power for sweet spot. And by a bit, I'm talking like 40 minutes. <laughs> so <laughs> he's, that's a very large portion. Uh, so, so first of all, and then he did uh, actually, before we get even further in your mind, build this trainer road workout, a flurry of attacks for four minutes where you are averaging way over threshold all the way up to a thousand Watts. And then you ride at 40 minutes at sweet spot. That already sounds like an absolutely brutal workout, right? Like really hard. Then if you look at this, he did 105% for nearly 17 minutes in terms of average power prior to blowing up. He did 127% for the final minute and then 185% for 30 seconds with a peak at 816 watts before he blew up. So, so Ian, that's why you blew up. It's not because your 30 second power is bad. <laughs> it's because of everything leading up to that. Right. Mm -hmm. So this is really common though, for us to do. I've, I've done this too, where I think, oh, well, what happened in the moment that I blew up was the reason that I blew up, but no, we're, we're the sum of the race's parts leading into that moment. And that's what, what ends up deciding it. So the 30 second power isn't why you blew up. You were just racing super hard. That was a really hard effort in this group ride. Nate, do you, do you want to jump in on something? I'm looking at it now. He did, for 103 minutes, he did normalized power of 305, uh, 314 NP. And then the last effort was, you know, he was doing, it was like 340, like, I, I don't know if it was, that's the very last one, but it was huge, way above his FTP, right? And yeah. of course you're going to die. Of course. <laughs> that is like, yeah. that is an all out race. That is tough. Um, mm -hmm. Probably got a pretty good... Probably it was pretty fun and went pretty hard, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I, it's, yeah, it's hard. Yes. You went like all the, out pretty much. Right. So if you find yourself in this situation where you're wondering why I blew up or why I got dropped, look at the moment, but then look at everything that happened before that moment. And, and make sure that you assign the proper or identify the proper context to be able to assign actionable items from that. Otherwise you'll think that in this case, your 30 second power was the reason. So you're just going to go bury yourself in 30 second efforts. And that's not going to be what you actually need to work on. Um, so there's definitely a discussion that we could have on efficiency and pace lines. We've talked about that so many times and being efficient in a pace line is very key, but I figure we should probably talk about training for that in particular. And the one thing that we say regularly is that it's about training the energy systems that are being utilized on race day, not just replicating specific context. So in this case, 
It's not about training your 30 second power. Instead, it's about training the energy systems that you need to be able to support these sort of efforts in this context of racing. So like part one, you mentioned this, I'll actually kind of indirectly, Nate, but a, thr a high threshold helps, right? So yeah, if, I, if I'm like seven Watts per kilo, but my FTP is 190 Watts, if I attack really hard and we're on a flat road against Nate, Nate's just not going to do anything because he's got a higher FTP. So a high threshold, number right one, that, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. A high Sorry. threshold matters, right? Like it's, it's You're extremely close. important. Uh, for yeah. That. And to that, when you think about like focusing on that 30 second effort, that is the specialty kind of the, you can get some gains on it, but they're going to be, um, there's going to be a limit to it and it's not gonna be as long-term. You raise your threshold this whole time, and suddenly, instead of that 7.2 watts per kilo, it's 6.5, and it's a lot easier. But if you were, like for me, we've talked about this, I, I need to do this, train my one-minute power. Um, I have a really high one-minute power relative, or at least I think I do, that's how I do well in races. Never trained it, but I'm not gonna do one-minute power for a very long time to try to raise that up, because that's the way that I win. But I could do it, eight weeks leading up to an A crit, right? And really kind of do that after I built this kind of base and build, got my threshold up really high, I can maintain a, a high part of it. Now I'm kind of like sharpen that knife of one kind of specific move for the kind of race thing, the race outcome that I want to do. That's great strategy, but I wouldn't want to focus on a whole year of, or, you know, a whole base or build of 30 second or one minute efforts mm -hmm. to get that up. Um, mm -hmm. How many people here where you raise your FTP and you look back and your 30 second power that used to be is now like your five minute power. Yeah. It's insane. Yeah. It's in yeah. my, mm -hmm. geez, when I'm off the couch, my FTP is 189. And I, I, I did more of that for Leadville for like nine hours. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that was killing me before. That's just an example mm -hmm. of raising that threshold rather than trying to like kind of split hairs. I, yeah. I <laughs> and imagine, <laughs> imagine riding in a pace line with your past self, like your past self would never want to ride with your future self because I the poles, myself. yeah, the poles would be way above threshold. Like when I'm riding with Pete at our local crits that we do, and it's super windy and we're doing these poles into wind. So it's necessarily high power. It's taking less out of Pete every time than it is taking out of me. That high threshold, especially because in a pace line, you don't get to decide really how hard you pedal as much as you're trying to maintain the pace of the group. Ideally, the speed stays consistent, right? So your power, when it goes to the front, you don't tell everybody doesn't say ride at, you know, X Watts, 400 Watts is what you need to do when you're on the front. Instead, it's just keep the pace consistent. You'll have more power output when you're at the front and then less power output when you're in back in line. But if it's a really high pace and that those poles at the front are way above your threshold, that's going to be tough. You can't control that. And that you can you just pull, it, just pedal less. Oh, that's just the thing to a certain extent, right? Like you shorten or lengthen your pulse. That's really how you do it instead no, of making them harder. Yeah. Or you get dropped. That's the other thing no, too. No. If you get to the front, you don't have to maintain the same speed. I, so many people don't, they just slow down. Sure. But there's a difference there in that case. I'm probably, if it's because I'm running up against a physical limitation because I can't push any harder, I'm probably going to get dropped from that group. Because usually what ends up happening, if you're in that pace line, right, Pete, and if I go to the front and the reason I'm not pulling hard or long is because I'm at my limit and it's too hard, then that group, if I slow the group down, it's going to reaccelerate. And then when I reattach on, it's going to take extra work. My time is limited. Like I have an expiration date in that group, in that pace line. But so like it, we're going to headwind, somebody stronger than me, they're pulling at 27. I get to the front and I go, Ooh, I don't want to do a 30 second pull more than 400. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to hit 380 and I slow down the group. The group still stays and it's still good. I don't have to maintain that, that 27. To a certain extent, but you are going to get popped eventually. If that happens, if no, it's, I, it's the opposite, I'll be less likely to get popped because I am more, um, I'm saving energy. No, no, no. I think you're missing the point. Pete, can you jump in on this? <clears throat> yeah, I think I think we're talking about two different pace lines. <clears throat> Nate's yeah. pace line is he's one of the strongest guys and he can do whatever he wants because no matter what happens, he's ready and capable. Um, where uh, Ian is probably the slowest guy, or I'm not going to say the slowest guy. He's having trouble in the pace line he is in. And so he is going to have to make decisions like skipping poles and if one of the problems is if you really have no extra bandwidth in the break or in the pace line and it 
someone comes around you fast while you're pulling, you have to reaccelerate so much that that's like a double match you just burned. You pulled and you had to catch back onto the back. Um, and if you're in a pace line, it's not always a headwind, uh, right? Like, so it's going to change and you can make different decisions over the course of the time. I think like we, we did say, Ian could position himself better in the pace line to save more energy. Like if you start, if you want to start the ride um, and take it easy for the first minute or two minutes while you're on the front, um, your first five minutes of your race ride is going to be much different than if you, you know, you accidentally let someone on the front and they're just throttling it for the first five minutes. That's a much different scenario that you're working with already. And it's only five minutes in. Um, but I think like Nate said, you can go slower and it's up to the group to either allow it or not allow it. And I, I do think that the best option for most people is, and to make the least amount of people unhappy is take a short, fast pull, maintaining the speed and only do five seconds. If you're really having problems, do roll through and do five seconds and then come back and spend as much energy as you can getting back in the draft and getting small and, and being on the correct side of the wheels and stuff like that, because that's going to make the difference. And if everybody else is doing 30 second pulls, it doesn't matter. It matters that you're like keeping the group together and you're just doing as, as little as you can to not blow yourself up in five minutes. Yeah, this is, uh, that, those are really great tips on how to survive in a pace line if you're on the limit, right? Because we're talking about getting dropped and, and really being on the fringe and it's not about pulling harder or easier. It's just about varying the duration. And mm -hmm. honestly, if you're in a, if you're in a pace line and you're on your limit, but you are still maintaining the speed, you just pull through and off like instantly, like you don't spend any time at the front. If that's the case, the group probably isn't going to get upset at all. In that case, if you're maintaining pace, you're probably going to be able to stay in there. And if it's sustainable, then you'll be able to hold in. It's really when you get to the point, if you start trying to do pulls that are too long or too hard, and then that has that cascading effect of shutting everything down, then that's when it gets really tough. So like physically speaking about like what's happening in a pace line, in most cases, you're talking about riding the doing over unders, right? Riding over your threshold for a short period of time. Then for the rest of the time, you're hopefully riding under your threshold. Although I've been parts of plenty of baselines where that's not the case. Like, yeah, over, like, over. Yeah, over, overs, right? Like, yeah. like put me in, like, if I ever tried to hold on the Legion's train, it would be like, just like anaerobic sprints followed by VO2 max, right? And I would just completely explode after a little bit. So, but really what we're talking about there is, is, is lactate shuttling and reprocessing. And so if you want to talk about how to train for that specifically, it's about making sure that number one, without a strong aerobic base and of conditioning, you can't be very good at this sort of work because of the fact that you need lots of little mitochondria to be able to carry out this process. And that happens as you train more, right? So more aerobic conditioning means that you'll be more aerobically fit. And that's a good solid platform to be able to build up on top of, but over unders of varying different kinds. Yeah, absolutely. will help for this. And that's why you'll see like in the rolling road race plans or in any of the different plans that you'll have threshold work that's going to be positioning you in spots where you have to produce a lot of lactate and then reprocess it. And you have to do so on uncomfortable timelines. And that's really the way that this works and it's how you get better at it. So physically speaking, that's kind of it. Um, one thing with this though, I can't think of a type of work that will more quickly expose a lack of proper fueling too. Like if you're on your limit, and then you have to ride at threshold and just be just above threshold, just below threshold and repeat that for a pace line, or maybe it's like 60 minutes. Oh my goodness. If you're low on fuel, that's going to feel absolutely impossible. So it's, it's definitely an important detail there. <clears throat> um, um, Nate, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I have a, a shopping list. So tahini, chard, chickpeas, shallots. I already have some garlic. Does that sound good, Pete? <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, uh, the, yes, that works. Okay, great. The, the yeah. chat, I think everyone just, we'll just do a whole episode of just like cooking recipes. You just do live cooking. People love it. Yeah. We'll just do Podcast. it live. Yeah. yeah John, that's, what, that's it. easy for you. Just do it live. John can I'm like, asking for. I need, can like I need, I need the it. visuals. Yeah. It'll be fantastic. We'll do it's it. Pete just walks around the kitchen and cooks. I don't want to bring us off of cooking with Pete because it's awesome. And we should just keep talking about this, but I do want to mention one thing though, with these over under style workouts, it's really key to understand that when you're doing over unders, there's a goal that you're trying to reach with that. Like it's, it's working toward usually like peak aerobic uptake or something like that at the end of those sets. Like you're, you should be spending the latter portions of that at peak aerobic uptake. And that's where we're really stretching your limits. 
A baseline is not designed like that. They are not saying, let's get to peak aerobic uptake, guys, and maintain that. Hang out. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's not like that. So even if you do all of this, if you jump into a pace line that's above your limits, you're still not going to be prepared. Or if you pace really poorly leading up to that, or you're not being efficient within the group, you're still going to be unprepared. So it's, it's really not just about having, making sure that it's like, you must be this tall to ride this ride. And then like, everything's magical. You still have to understand where your limits are and then figure out how do I respect my limits within the context of this specific pace line right now. And there are plenty of times where I'm in a pace line where I realize like, okay, well, actually I have to keep my head up and on a swivel and be able to react right now. It's less about preserving energy and making sure I'm super diligent or I need to drive the pace. And sometimes it's, I'm hanging on for dear life. So I need to optimize so much because my limits put me here. The pace line's asking me to rise to this occasion. So you really just have to be able to comprehend your limits in relation to that pace line and then be able to do it. Training matters, but execution matters a lot for sure. So who's ready to race? Oh, I want to race so bad. Whenever we do these like deep tactics, I'm just like, I want to race. I know. (laughs) Yeah, it's good. What'd you hear, Pete? Uh, we, we need to harass Rich for some local racing because Tuesday nights would, would make my week much happier. Yes, uh, I agree. So let's just all, let's all pick it in front of, or uh, send emails to Rich and say, yeah, we're ready. Uh, podcast listeners right now, we'll give out his, I'm just joking. Yeah. <laughs> do a vaccine passport. Like, yeah, I don't know what the CDC says, but outside, if we've all been vaccinated, that sounds like a okay thing, but I don't really know. For yeah, sure. I don't know either. Yeah. We just want it. That's what we know. We just want it. Yeah. But we want to be safe. That's what I want to say. <laughs> If you like this video, make sure you give us a thumbs up. If you didn't like this video, you can give it a thumbs down, but let us know what you would have done differently in the comments below. If you want to see more of these videos, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you want to become a faster cyclist, check out trainerroad.com. Do it. If you think I have better hair than Jonathan, give it a thumbs up. If not, leave a comment. My hair is better than his.